quite a range of people here. Right, if you didn't hear that, this is just to say that we are recording the meeting, so if for any reason you don't want to be recorded, either switch your video off or switch your microphone off or leave the meeting. But uh, it's, per it's uh, uh, so, so, so the next thing to say is, if you've got any questions, please put them in the chat. If, if questions do occur to you after, after the uh, session and and we're already into the questions, then for, happy, happy to happy to uh, uh, sort of keep putting them in the chat. And if there are any things any, any things that Richard can't get back on today, I'm sure he'll be able to get back on later. So to introduce the session, so I'll introduce Richard. So Rich, Richard has worked in the industry for just over 20 years. So he started at 2022, 2002, working for Baird's Malt and has had a variety of roles. He currently holds the role of Vice President of United Malt and General Manager for the UK. Uh, Richard is a Master Maltster, which is the highest accolade in the malting industry exams, and is a committee member of the AHDB Barley Oats and Other Cereals Committee, as well as the IBD Malting Barley Committee. And, and he's certainly been involved in the MAGB Technical Committee in all the time I've been, so I can remember. Uh, for, before working for Baird's, Richard gained an honours degree in brewing and distilling, uh, as well as a PhD in barley endosperm structure. Uh, I know at least one of those, if not both, were at Harriet Watt University. And I know we've probably got people on call, the call with Harriet Watt. So I'll hand over to Richard. Now, I, I'm actually going to present the slides because of a technical glitch at uh, Richard, Richard's end. But uh, so let's see if we can make it smooth. Over to you, Richard. Thank you, Julian, and uh, and welcome everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, yes, apologies for the slight technical glitch at my end, but luckily we had a contingency plan, Julian, so um, it's uh, it's in full flow now. Um, so, Julian, if you want to just click forward to the first slide. Uh, this afternoon, I would like to just give you a, um, I guess a, an overview of uh, modern steeping and effluent systems uh, deployed across the UK and around the globe. Um, some of the, uh, I guess, the principal objective of steeping and then for context, the technology that we utilise uh, for both steeping systems and effluent systems, right through from conventional uh, steeping systems to some of the most modern technology which is deployed um, and I guess some of the reasons uh, for the modern technology and the advantages and disadvantages of, uh, of said technology. Um, similarly, for the, the effluent treatment systems, really a um, an insight into some of the, the different technology which is used, um, the advantages and disadvantages and the reasons why we utilise it in certain situations. Um, and then finally, a comparison of, uh, of the technologies um, for some greater analysis towards the end. Uh, as Julian said, um, uh, happy to take uh, questions at the end and I look forward to interacting with you towards the end of the presentation. Next slide, please, Julian. Thank you. Um, so, as I'm sure many people are aware, uh, the malting process is, is not a uh, is not a new process by any means. Um, you know, the the history of malting goes back many many um, centuries, um, and in the beginning, uh, it's believed that uh, the steeping process was was uh, was performed by effectively dunking grain in uh, in some sort of uh, vessel, um, maybe even a um, a well. Uh, with to hydrate the grain much like we do today. So, you know, many, many centuries ago, um, uh, our ancient ancestors understood the principle of trying to hydrate the grain to initiate uh, uh, the biochemical processes within the grain. Um, and, you know, we, in a, in a definitely more technical way, we still continue to do um, what they practiced um, many centuries ago. Next slide, please, Julian. So really just to, I'm sure just about everybody on the call will understand the main objectives of, uh, of steeping, but just briefly to ultimately to, to initiate the germination of the, of the barley grain. So we're, um, we're hydrating uh, the endosperm, we're uh, hydrating the, the embryo, and we're starting the biochemical processes. Um, and, uh, and then we are clearly we, we then control uh, germination and kilning thereafter. 
Um, it's achieved by immersing the grain uh, typically several times, but I will come on to uh, uh, some technology which just sees uh, the grain being immersed once. Uh, typically, I guess conventionally it would be twice um, with an air rest in, uh, in between the two immersions. Um, and during that air rest, you would typically remove uh, the CO2 generated by the, uh, the barley grains uh, through the respiration process and also removing any excess heat uh, from the grain bed uh, under controlled conditions. Um, so that's very briefly a summary of what we do during the steeping process. Um, and Julian, if you just move on to the first slide. We deploy various systems to allow us to do that. Um, next slide, please, Julian. Um, and, and reality is steeping system design has, has the biggest influence on the, the amount of water that we utilise uh, and to an extent also the, the quality of the uh, of the, the steeped barley and in the end the, the malt that we produce. Now typically um, the lowest kind of conventional usage that you see today in a, in a modern malting is, um, would be around about three and a half metres cubed of water per tonne of malt produced. Uh, but uh, there are other, uh, I guess, less efficient technologies still deployed across the globe, and uh, I can say that you know it's not uncommon to have water usage of um, of around about five meters cubed uh, per uh, meter cubed of water per ton of malt produced uh, on a conventional two immersion process. Now, uh, I know there are some customers that uh, that would require more immersions than that, and you know, ultimately they. The water usage would uh, continue uh, fairly significantly after that five meters cubed if you're using more than two immersions. So, but it gives you a good a good picture. We're talking about three and a half to five um, meters cubed of water per ton of malt produced. Um, some of the factors that can influence influence that uh, uh, consumption. Um, uh, I'll come on to barley washing later, but there are uh, some maltsters who utilise a, a barley washing phase prior to a steeping phase, and that has its Advantages um, from uh, possibly from quality point of view, depending on your your insight, and also definitely from a hygiene point of view within the maltings. But it, you know, clearly we are utilising uh, water and generating effluent uh, for that process. Um, steep tank design does utilize, uh, sorry, does control the um, the amount of water that you use. Uh, there are many different uh, steep tank designs, and I'll come on to those uh, through the course of this presentation. Something I won't really cover in any great detail, but uh, sorry, if you come back one, Julian, thank you. Um, I won't really cover, but the, but also the, the filling and discharge method for the uh, for the steep tank and eventual transfer to germination um, can determine the the amount of water used in the maltings. Um, I'm kind of considering that outside of the steeping effort process today, but uh, but there are dry transfers and there are pumped transfers, and clearly if you you're pumping. Um, the grain, then you're going to be utilising water during that phase as well. Um, the sanitation uh, method and standard, which the uh, the malting company would uh, would wish to achieve, whether that's manual or uh, automatic, etc., whether any chemicals are generated, clearly has a, an influence on the um, on the amount of water used. Um, and also, as I've alluded to, some uh, 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 quality and customer requirements to really dictate. To an extent, how much water uh, is used, um, and indeed sometimes how much effluent is generated. Um, and I guess to summarise, you know, modern steeping uh, tank design, as I um, have recently been involved with uh, our new maltings build in Inverness, uh, you know, must, has to consider um, the technology to deploy, in particular for you know, minimising water usage, um, but also meeting customer specs. And um, nowadays, as ever. Um, the long term sustainability um, of the plant and uh, the goals of the company uh, as well. Thank you, Julian. Next slide. So, just to summarise what would be considered to be one of the, the two main um, steeping systems that, uh, that would be deployed in, um, in maltings across the globe. So, this would be a cylindrical conical vessel. Um, and you can see from the, uh, the Small diagram over to the right hand side of the slide. Uh, what uh, what we mean by that? So it's a conical shaped um, bottomed vessel, uh, generally circular at the top, um, uh, deploying. Uh, sorry, um, with uh, uh, both filled and emptied via gravity, um, with CO two extraction and uh, and uh, aeration during 
uh, the wet face as, as would be typical. Um, there are some pros and cons, I suppose. So it's it's self-emptying, so we don't require any any equipment to empty the uh, the vessel once the process has come to an end. That obviously is an, an advantage from just a complexity point of view um, and maintenance point of view. Um, it has probably the lowest water usage uh, compared to other technologies for for the vessel design, if you like, because there's no plenum uh, chamber below the vessel, as we'll come on to um, see later on other vessels. Um, uh, easy sanitation, as you can see, um, and you can you can imagine uh, with vertical sides and conical bottoms, it's relatively easy to keep clean um, from the top, typically in a maltings, um, and relatively low cost of manufacturing due to its um, lack of complexity uh, in reality. Um, the cons, um, I guess, well, um, you know, size limitation, typically um, to look after green quality, you wouldn't go much above 50 tonnes at a time. I know there are a few maltings that have gone a little bit above that, but that's an indication anyway of the ballpark tonnage that you would typically go for um, uh, in a modern uh, large conical vessel. Um, its bed depth is typically a bit deeper than some other vessels that we'll come on to in a minute, and that does have a, an effect on the grain that's within the tank, and particularly the grain towards the bottom of the tank, which is under uh, a little bit more pressure from uh, the grain above, with the, the depth being uh, higher. Uh, and it does lead to some uh, quality uh, interactions, I suppose, in comparison to the, the shallower uh, steeping bed depths of, of other tanks. Um, it also makes CO2 extraction more difficult uh, during the, uh, the aeration phase, sorry, uh, yeah, the, the, uh, the air rest phase, um, because you're sucking uh, the, the heat and the CO2 from the respiration process down through a relatively small uh, area at the bottom of the tank through what is a, a slightly more um, deep tank than other uh, technologies. So uh, ultimately, from a quality point of view, there are some um, uh, things to consider, I suppose, when, when designing this tank, but certainly it has um, the best water utilisation per tonne of the technologies that we uh, that you would typically deploy. Um, if you wish to control the, the temperature um, of the air which was being applied um, and extracted through the grain uh, during the air rest phase, then these types of tanks are more difficult to do that with. Typically, they would be open topped, but I can say the most modern um, and I've seen large modern ones uh, deployed in the last five years or so, and they have a cover over the top, uh, which allows uh, uh, temperated air to be fed into the top of the tank for the CO2 extraction phase. That does have um, uh, does make it more difficult to um, clean the tank uh, in between uh, batches, but you can see there's a trade-off there as to whether uh, hygiene or ease of hygiene uh, is more important than uh, temperature control. And I can see in, in temperate um, climates, it's maybe not such a concern, but in warm climates with ambient temperatures above 25 to 30 degrees in the summer, then um, certainly. Um, keeping control of the grain temperature during the air rest phase is, is extremely important. So uh, a cover on the tank is, is very much the, the way that uh, technology is moving uh, from modern large conical tanks. Thank you, Julian. Next slide, Jim. Julian. Thank you. Um, so for uh, the other main type of uh, steeping system would be considered a, a flat bottom tank and there are a couple of designs of flat bottom tanks but as you can see here that uh, a large circular vessel um, with a plenum chamber underneath so the grain bed sits uh, maybe a foot and a half to two foot off the uh, off the base of the tank um, and that is to allow uh, more even CO2 extraction in the main uh, during the air rest phase um, so that you're not sucking the CO2 um, out and the heat out of the bed through a very small hole in the bottom of the tank, you're sucking it from uh, a large area um, all the way around the tank evenly across what would be a, a, also a flat bed. So it's much better for, um, for green temperature control um, and heat, uh, temperature, sorry, green temperature and, and CO2 extraction, etc. Um, a shallow bed allows um, the reduction in, in pressure on the, on the base of the um, the grain at the bottom of the tank, so um, slightly better from a quality point of view. 
typically you can go for relatively large um, vessels. Uh, I've seen them uh, above 380 tons, which is which is the tanks that we have um, around about 380 tons, uh, but they can go higher. Um, there's uh, if you're using a conical tank of maybe 50 tons, you know, for modern large batches, you might have six or even eight tanks in a row to complete one batch, and there's slight differences between each uh, conical tank. Um, in, a, in a flat bottom steep tank, for example, you're, you're just utilizing uh, one tank, so it's all the batch in one tank, so the batch is, is much more homogeneous. Um, and as I've mentioned, CO2 extraction uh, much more even um, and also. Um, more even uh, aeration during the, the wet phase as well to uh, oxygenate the water during the uh, during the immersion phase. It does have some cons, um, as all technology does um, in, steep, in, uh, in the molten process. Um, mechanical discharge, so you're maintaining and reliant on mechanical discharge. Um, the, I can say they are relatively reliable, but uh, obviously it's something to maintain. Um, Underfloor hygiene is, is always a concern. So modern steep tank design now includes um, like butterfly wings, which hinge up uh, to allow uh, periodic cleaning underneath the tank. But clearly, it's it's more difficult to um, to clean under that tank than it is uh, a vertical and conical bottomed um, uh, tank, as I as I show in this the previous slide. Um, and there is a water excess water usage. Uh, for that water that, that goes underneath the um, underneath the grain bed before it touches the grain, uh, there is a, a volume of water which is used without um, effectively uh, touching the grain. So that can vary, uh, but you know you, you could be typically utilising uh, 100 metres cubed or so prior to touching the um, uh, touching the grain in a 380 tonne batch size. So you can see suddenly you're, you're adding 20 or 25 percent extra. Uh, water usage to, uh, to your steeping system at that point. Next slide, please, Julian. To try and combat that extra water usage, um, Bueller, one of the main uh, equipment manufacturers, came up with a design about um, 12 or 14 years ago, uh, which they called an eco steep. Um, we have one um, in our booth at Maltings. Uh, so that does away with the plenum chamber underneath the, uh, the flat bottom tank uh, and utilizes us, as you can see there in the, the top of the two pictures, a very complex um, arrangement of pipework, uh, both for aeration and CO2 extraction. Um, so there are, are discs in the base of the floor of the tank to uh, both aerate during the, um, the wet phase and CO2 extract during the dry phase. It seems that Richard is uh, fro Richard's connections frozen. Just a brief pause while we try and reconnect. You may not know, of course. Okay, well, you're still connected, Robbie. Uh, we're still connected, yeah, but Richard might not know that he's still connected or he's not connected. He's probably still talking. No, I would imagine his system has probably told him. But anyway, I'll give him, I'll give, I'll try and give him a call. Um, if you'd like, I can um, take him out of the WebEx and that should prompt him to sign himself back in. Good idea, Jess. Do you want to do that? I'm giving it a go. Okay. Yeah, so we're the best, the best multi technology in the world, but uh, not necessarily the best internet technology.
Um, I've expelled him from the meeting, so hopefully he should try and rejoin and it should work. I don't think Richard's having a very good time to deal with his um, IT equipment. Given his computer crash this morning. Yeah, 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 yeah. Hopefully, ho ho hopefully, he'll be able to get back on. These things are usually quite intermittent. Ah, let's let him in. He's waiting. Good. Can you hear us? Julian, I'm back. Ah, uh, yeah. Good. Welcome back. I don't know. If, yeah, uh, it said I was removed from the meeting, which I thought was a bit harsh. I thought it wasn't going that badly. Um, but, uh, but anyway, uh, yeah, I'll do the, the technical term was expelled. But uh, yes. Anyway, so <laughs> it's on the same slide that you were on when you when, when you when your system froze. So I'll, I'll hand over. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you, Julian. Uh, yeah, I think I was just closing my my comments on uh, on eco steeping uh, to say that we we like to get it out of the tank as quickly as possible and into germination. So I think we can move on, Julian. Thank you. Um, I mentioned barley washing earlier. Um, so barley washing is a consideration. It's, it's, it's strictly speaking, it's not necessary for the uh, uh, for the steeping process. It's an additional step which some officers like to take, and we have taken the decision to. Uh, uh, to wash some of our barley uh, at some of our sites, we uh, so I'd just like to talk about technology, I guess, just for for context. Um, typically, we would deploy a couple of barley washers. There's just a picture of just one there in this, and the, uh, on the slide there would be a um, one just off to the right as well. Um, it uh, and they're, they're relatively large pieces of kit. They wash our grain at typically around about 100 tons an hour. Um, it utilizes some uh, some makeup water to uh, initially to uh, to clean the grain and then utilize some some, some sprays to then uh, float and uh, spray off um, any detritus that's washed off the top of the grain any uh, straw or husk that's made its way through the cleaning system uh, and just uh, ultimately the screws then take the grain the cleaned grain out of the um, the water bed there as you can see uh, and on to the steeping process it does have an advantage of adding um, a little bit of moisture to the grain and uh, almost in a pre-steeping um, type of way. It, uh, um, it, we found it to add, you know, perhaps 10% moisture to the grain uh, through a, a half an hour kind of residence time. Um, but there is water usage associated with it. Um, so it, it clearly it needs to be considered uh, overall uh, for the site water and effluent usage uh, from a consideration point of view. Um, it, and, but it does allow some additional flexibility in the steeping process. So, uh, if your grain is uh, particularly water sensitive, uh, or has a, uh, a slightly higher microbial loading, then you you do have the ability to uh, to uh, have very flexible steeping regimes associated with the um, the barley washing uh, technology. So, uh, we like them, but they're they're not for everybody. Um, uh, and certainly, you need to consider the additional water usage as part of the, the overall picture. Next slide, please, Julian. So, just really to summarise the um, the three technologies that I've talked about um, mainly. So, the uh, to the right, the, the first um, technology, the large conicals, uh, conventional flat bottom steep tank in the middle, and then an eco steep to the left. Um, and I guess just to summarise some of the main points. So, the, the second line. Uh, showing the, the higher loading per uh, per meter cubed of um, 
uh, the surface area, so the grain under slightly more pressure. Um, the, the product height, again, the fourth line, uh, showing that the conical is under uh, with a greater um, product height uh, and its effect ultimately on uh, CO2 extraction and aeration. Uh, the, the CO2 extraction capacity, uh, about halfway down the slide, you can see there the, the conventional tanks as opposed to uh, conventional conicals as opposed to a conventional flat bottom tank. Um, so you can see you're much more able to con uh, uh, control temperature uh, during the, uh, the rest phases um, and uh, the slightly greater aeration capacity for both eco steeps and uh, flat bottoms in comparison to conicals as well. But if you go to the bottom, you can see the water usage comparison for uh, large conicals against flat bottoms. There are there is definitely an, an increase in water usage. Um, but uh, and you can see what the, the eco steep was attempting to do with its, its change in technology with no plenum chamber. Um, with added complications of uh, more difficult to control temperature uh, during the air phases there. And as I've said, barley washing is an option, um, but that would add typically around about half a meter cubed uh, of water per tonne to your overall site usage. And that needs to be really considered uh, when you look at your, your F linked uh, treatment systems, which I'll, I'll come on to uh, in the next slides. Thank you, Julian. And the next slide, please, Julian. Thank you. So there are there are a variety of uh, effluent discharge um, or and effluent treatment systems deployed in uh, maltings across the UK and globally. Um, I guess the most simple is just direct discharge. Um, so there are some malting sites that have uh, a permit for untreated effluent to be discharged to a local water course or or the sea, etc. Uh, and of course, whilst cost effective um, in comparison to you know, conventional treatment systems, uh, they do have an impact on the environment um, and they are closely monitored and, and regulated by, by CEPA and uh, the Environmental Agency. Thank you, Julian. Next slide. Um, so, if you go back a few decades, then a conventional effluent treatment system might have looked like um, uh, the one on the uh, the slide there, which is a, um, is a, an aerobic treatment system utilizing many different types of technology, ultimately to, to clean the effluent to the point of discharge into either a local water course or indeed the local municipal um, effluent treatment systems. Um, typically, you might deploy a, a fixed um, bed trickle arms, um, trickle filter beds, uh, aer aerated, sorry, no, uh, aerobic bio towers. So we pass the effluent over a biomass and it digests the effluent as, um, as it passes across. And then settlement tanks, um, with very uh, good technology at what they do, settling out solids uh, and allowing uh, clean effluent to, to wear over in a very controlled fashion. Uh, all of those technologies together. Uh, are really quite effective at reducing the, uh, for example, COD, COD um, and suspended solids of the effluent produced in a malting plant. Um, and we we utilise that technology at one of our sites, and I'll come on to the, the performance of that overall um, in comparison to other technologies later on in the, in the presentation. Thank you, Julian. Certainly. Uh, Relatively modern technology is uh, is an AD system for for malting effluent uh, treatment. Um, AD systems are uh, have taken some time to uh, make their way into uh, effluent treatment for malting sites, because AD is not typically well um, designed for uh, for malting's effluent, which is large volume and relatively low strength in comparison to um, something that more conventionally would be treated with. Uh, AD, uh, but there are a couple of uh, manufacturers now offering AD systems for malting F1. Uh, we utilise one now, um, uh, and it's relatively effective at what it does. Um, so you pump F1 through a fluidised bed of, of anaerobic bacteria and microbes, um, and the organic compounds are digested effectively, um, create methane uh, and carbon dioxide, um, and then. Uh, the resulting digested effluent is passed through um, a fixed layer uh, film filter, 
um, as a publisher ultimately for, for final removal. So it's largely uh, and then discharged. Um, if you move to the next slide, um, Julian. Thank you. Um, the performance is very much determined by the specification of the unit, the, the height uh, of the unit, the uh, and the throughput design. Um, there can be a number of these modules in, in series uh, to treat large volumes of, of effluent, but they can be now, um, just in the last five years or so, they have been utilised in molten sites, um, and they can be utilised for really quite effective reduction in COD and suspended solids, um, as per the, um, the figures on the slide there. Um, pretty significant. It does, as ever, have advantages and disadvantages, but um, I have to say they, they, they have been marketed as being a one-stop shop for effluent uh, treatment to a point, and I would say they're probably not. Um, the, the AD system actually likes um, liquid um, maltings effluent with very little particulate uh, coming in, um, and conventional effluent from a maltings might contain, you know, the old rootlet, etc., which uh, which really the, these AD systems are not particularly uh, set up to um, to deal with. So um, they they work quite well with a uh, conventional effluent treatment system prior to it. So maybe a, a filter and a um, trickle filter bed or a bio tower, etc., uh, leading to this site. But uh, but these units themselves then make a significant reduction in COD and uh, and suspend solids of the effluent prior to discharge. Um, after that, uh, that initial pre pre effluent treatment uh, treatment step, um, and as the spin off benefit, of course, is as methane is produced, that methane can be captured and uh, reused, um, or if the um, if the unit isn't of the right size, it can be uh, vented off uh, or flared off um, until the right use is found for it. Thank you, Julian. Next slide. Um, a relatively new piece of technology that's come to Malting's uh, effluent treatment and steeping uh, system design is um, is an opti steep. I've I've placed this in the um, in the effluent treatment uh, area of the presentation, but I guess it could just about as justifiably be put up on the steeping system. So it is utilised during steeping uh, to reduce steeping volumes and uh, effluent volumes. Um, uh, and to allow effectively a one a single immersion uh, steeping system to be uh, utilised in a maltings. I say typically today um, two immersion would be the, the basis which most molting, molting sites would uh, would utilise. Um, so and if you, everyone just has a look at this large kind of cartridges um, with interconnecting pipe work, and these cartridges do uh, different jobs. And I'll explain what they do in the, in the next uh, couple of slides, Julian. So we're really harking back to some of the um, the original steeping methodology, which was used um, in the beginning, you know, with uh, with our ancient ancestors dunking grain in um, some sort of water uh, vessel uh, to initiate the uh, steeping hydration process. Um, so uh, opti steep, as it's termed, um, is uh, allows. Then the monster to utilise a single immersion steeping, allowing the hydration of the grain uh, to reduce the overall water and effluent use of the malting site. Um, now, the reason why uh, historically we've utilised two immersions uh, during the, uh, the malting process is the grain likes to have uh, ultimately a break between the uh, the two immersions to um, uh, just you know, literally catch its breath to start the respiration process. Uh, particularly in, uh, in uh, Scotland, where the water sensitivity of the grain means that it actually doesn't like to spend a long period of time under water. It likes to have a, um, two um, uh, immersions uh, split up with, a, uh, with an air rest in between. Um, there, there are a number of reasons why grain doesn't like a single immersion, but uh, one of them is the, um, the build-up of uh, organic compounds within the steep water. Um, and the lack of dissolved oxygen as well for the respiration process. And OptiSteep attempts to um, uh, to deal with both of those um, uh, in in certain way. If you move on to the next slide, Julian. Um, there's, I guess it's a two phase process. So there's the absorption phase and then the oxidation phase. Uh, so the, 
the OptiSteep technology is deployed throughout the, um, uh, the steeping process. So uh, steep water is extracted from the steep tank, passed through the, the OptiSteep equipment, and then returned to the steep tank um, throughout the, the immersion phase. So uh, cleaning the steep water during the steeping phase effectively. Um, and uh, because we're able to clean the steep water, um, the grain will, uh, will continue to hydrate to the point where after a single immersion, it's, it's nearly at the point where um, you would consider uh, a two immersion steeping uh, program to have reached the, the optimum um, uh, steep moisture. I would say it's, you don't achieve the same um, moisture at the end of a single immersion with OptiSteep as you do after two immersions. But under certain circumstances, uh, the hydration and the, uh, the speed of respiration and, uh, and ultimately germination is sufficient for the malting process to be uh, fully initiated and ultimately for a good malt quality to be made at the end of the malting process. Uh, so this technology is now uh, being deployed across a number of malting sites. We have one at our sister uh, malting site in North America, um, not in the UK, but um, I'm aware of the technology and I'm aware of the, the quality of the malt that it produces. Uh, to a, a reasonable standard um, and it's something that we will look at long term uh, for our business as well as whether it, it makes sense for us uh, in the UK. Julian. Um, it reduces the steeping water by uh, so the steeping water by um, 40 to 50 percent and probably the, the overall water usage of the malting site by around about 35 percent. Um, and therefore a reduction in effluent generation by uh, roughly 35 to 40% as well. Um, it does reduce the strength of the effluent prior to treatment um, uh, by around about, as you can see there, 38, 39% uh, across BUD and CUD metrics, uh, which is obviously a significant reduction in, in effluent strength, um, which would, I would imagine, then typically lead, uh, be then uh, further treated with an, another effluent treatment system. The OptiSteep, I suppose, is not an effluent treatment system in, on its own right, but it is. Um, uh, it does reduce the strength of the effluent uh, that is then uh, passed on to the resulting effluent treatment system later in the maltings. So there are advantages and, and as ever, disadvantages of it. Um, and then lastly, the technology that uh, I wanted to talk about on effluent treatment um, is, a, is a more complex um, uh, system which we deploy at a couple of our sites now. Um, so this is a, uh, a technology which resulted from uh, the MEGB and French maltsters work back in the mid uh, early 2000s, uh, the MEGB Swan project, uh, which uh, resulted in, in maltsters being able to prove that uh, steep water, uh, or steep effluent could be then treated with an advanced membrane bioreactor aeration, uh, sorry, aerobic uh, bioreactor, um, filtration systems, uh, ultrafiltration, and then reverse osmosis to produce water of um, of a very high standard, uh, which could then be utilised for uh, for steeping again. So it, it has the added benefit of treating effluent and generating steep water at the same time. Julian, if you move on. Um, so it's been used by maltsters across the UK, uh, anyway, I know, for um, more than 10 years now. Uh, we've had one plant uh, in England for seven or eight years and no other um, competitor maltster in, uh, in, uh, in England has uh, a very similar system and we've just installed one um, in our Inverness site. Um, the main, as I said, the main advantages of this, of this F1 treatment system is it actually generates clean water for steeping again. So it has a a significant reduction in the uh, in the uh, the impact of uh, the amount of water needed for the maltings and also the amount of effluent generated from the maltings. Um, with regards to steep water recovery, uh, greater than seventy percent is, is certainly um, achievable, and in fact, uh, the most modern technology claims to be up around eighty-five percent. So that's for one hundred meters cubed of effluent, which you send to the effluent plant, you would generate eighty-five meters cubed of, uh, of water for steeping again. Which are, I think you can see is a very high efficiency, um, and uh, obviously reduces your your water consumption by that eighty five meters cubed of uh, of water. Not only is the um, F one discharge reduced by that um, 
70 to 85 percent efficiency that I've talked about there. Um, but uh, it reduces the strength of the effluent which you discharge as well in, com uh, in comparison to a, a conventional uh, treatment system. And I'll, I'll go on to compare those as well. Uh, so the resulting effluent is um, significantly reduced in strength as well. So that, that remaining um, 30 to 15 percent um, is, is quite weak in comparison to um, conventional malting effluent. Thank you, Julian. So the first phase of the effluent treatment system uh, is the bioreactor. So that's an aerobic bioreactor continuously mixed to maintain dissolved oxygen concentration uh, at a certain level. Um, Blowers are, con are controlled by the dissolved oxygen uh, content within the tank, and they come in and uh, in and out as, as necessary to maintain that. Um, and you know, we maintain a certain amount of biomass in that tank. We feed it with a certain uh, volume of effluent every day to to ultimately feed uh, the uh, the biomass within the tank um, and uh, maintain its 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 health and its um, viability as well. Moving on, Julian. The first stage of the, the filtration process is, uh, is what we call ultrafiltration. So, um, effluent from the, um, the bioreactor is fed uh, through these filtration membranes, and we separate the, um, the uh, ultrafiltration water um, from the, the biomass. And the biomass is returned back to the uh, bioreactor tank, um, and uh, the clean water uh, or cleaned water, ultrafiltration water, is then passed forward for further treatment. Um, you do build up biomass in the bioreactor tank. Clearly, as you're, you're continually feeding it, it, it grows. The biomass grows, so you have to remove um, uh, almost on a daily, daily basis some biomass from the tank uh, to keep the, uh, the rough concentration of biomass uh, relatively static. And that biomass is then um, either um, you can utilize a, a centrifuge or you can take it as a, as a uh, effluent slurry uh, away for composting or um, spreading on land as a fertilizer, etc., depending on the situation. I would say though that the uh, these membranes like to be uh, fed liquid effluent with again very little particulate. So we have a, um, uh, a very fine strainer, uh, two two sets of strainers in fact, uh, to make sure that we aren't feeding the the membranes with um, with any particulate. They will block, uh, and once they block. Um, you can backwash them, but they get if they get blocked to a point, then um, backwashing is difficult and need to be manually cleaned. And as you can imagine, there with all those holes, manually cleaning those filters is is not the nicest of tasks. So uh, we do try our very best to maintain a liquid effluent into the, um, those filter cartridges. Um, if we move on, um, we then take the ultrafiltration water um, across uh, reverse osmosis. Membrane and why? Well, you can see there the top water um, quality um, is significantly improved by reverse osmosis. So we would remove some metal ions, um, some viruses, bacteria, etc., um, that uh, ultrafiltration might let through. Uh, but reverse osmosis is extremely clean uh, water, and in fact uh, contains less less salts than you might uh, imagine. Just you know, tap water would. So it's uh, in many respects, it's kind of cleaner than tap water, and that's why uh, it isn't classed as potable water because it doesn't have the same sort of uh, salt content that uh, the tap water would. So it's, it has a reduced salt um, salt content, it's very thin uh, to feel and to touch. Um, I, have, I have drunk a little bit of it. Um, it, uh, it. It feels very thin on the on the palate as well um, because it is extremely clean. Um, moving on, Julian, the reverse osmosis membranes. Um, are very high pressure membranes, so you're uh, pushing the water across um, from a, um, a high salt content to a low salt content, which uh, for the anybody who remembers their um, higher uh, biology, you know, it's not what water wants to do. You're pushing it across uh, the different way from um, uh, that it wants to go naturally. So that does require quite a lot of pressure. Um, and these these membranes do require quite a lot of energy uh, to maintain. Again, and it needs to be considered when considering design and uh, ultimately the opex of of the plant. Um, you you then utilise the the um, uh, the water which comes off the clean side of the membranes, and there is some some discharge which is then fed back into 
uh, the effort treatment system again for retreatment, so it's not wasted. Um, very high recovery rates, as I've mentioned, uh, of up to 85 percent. Julian? We utilise a belt and braces approach. Our HACCP plan uh, dictates that we would maintain a, um, a very high strength uh, UV treatment on the end of the RO, which um, should there be any uh, problems at all with the RO banks, then um, this treatment system would kill any um, uh, bacteria or viruses. I have to say we've never had one yet, uh, but we have it there for, um, uh, I guess, that belt and braces, as I've just mentioned. So it's good from a customer point of view to and be able to talk about the, the safety that we have in our system from a food safety point of view and a water quality point of view. Thank you, Julian. And then finally, a comparison on, on the treatment systems which, uh, which we deploy. Um, so just talking about the, the discharge initially, as you can see, well, no, no treatment effectively um, and relatively cheap, uh, depending on the, the length of the pipe um, from the maltings to wherever discharge is made. Um, the other steps over to the right, the four columns to the right, that direct discharge all have their, um, their efficiencies and um, advantages and disadvantages, etc. Um, you know, conventional uh, aerobic treatment, such as we have at, uh, one of our older maltings, is really highly efficient, um, but it does deploy a lot of technology, um, you know, various bio towers and trickle filter beds and uh, settlement tanks, etc. Maybe even a sand filter. Uh, you know, deploys a lot of technology to get uh, a high efficiency of treatment, um, and it. Uh, Historically, it would have required manpower as well. You can automate them nowadays, but um, historically, it would have uh, required a person to operate the plant. Um, but the resulting quality is, is very good. It has a relatively low um, OPEX uh, as long as you can automate, um, and the impact on the environment is very, you know, is very little as well. Uh, but certainly, the, the cost to build nowadays would be, would be high um, in comparison to um, some other technologies. Um, the anaerobic system that we deploy at one of our plants is, as I've said, is um, considering its relative simplicity, uh, is very good from a COD and suspended solids point of view for what is a, um, a relatively small footprint treatment system. Um, its uh, cost to build is, I would say, a, a medium uh, comparison, and uh, ongoing OPEX is also medium. Uh, but the, the impact on the environment, again, is, uh, is low given the, the high strength of. So the high efficiency of treatment uh, from that very small footprint system. OptiSteep has uh, has its advantages and disadvantages. Of course, it does reduce the the uh, COD of the um, the effluent produced, as I've mentioned, and the and the, ultimately the volume uh, of the maltings uh, that of the water and the effluent that the maltings would require by around about thirty percent. Uh, but it uh, it does have relatively high ongoing uh, OPEX costs um, and really probably we need a, a tertiary um, uh, treatment step for, uh, for before discharge uh, of the effluent. And then really the, the, um, the most complex but, uh, but also the most uh, efficient at generating um, steeping water and, and treating effluent is our, uh, our uh, AMBR or RO plant, advanced membrane bioreactor and RO plant. As you can see there, a very high efficiency at reduction of COD, around about 80%, extremely high reduction in suspended solids. Um, I've been relatively generous there and said, you know, effluent volume reduction greater than 70%. Uh, we're seeing higher than that. Um, and in, indeed, 85% is, uh, is on the cards for uh, the technology in the near future. It does produce some sludge. Um, it does have a relatively high OPEX and um, CAPEX cost, but as you can see there, with the savings in water and um, uh, and effluent uh, discharge volumes, um, and also thinking about you know, ultimately impact on the environment with reduction, significant reduction in water usage and effluent discharge for the long term, and you can see the attractiveness of the of the technology long term, uh, which is hence why we we have made the decision to to utilise it. Thank you, Julian, and thank you all for uh, for listening today. Um, I hope that gives some insight into the technology we we deploy and some of the reasons why, um, the the various advantages and disadvantages of the technology uh, and the, some of the the impacts on 
uh, on the quality of our uh, malted products ultimately uh, and of, uh, also the, the impact that we have on the environment uh, long term as well. Happy to pass the microphone back over to you, Julian, for, uh, for any questions which have been raised in the background. Yeah, thanks very much, Richard, for that. And well done for coping with the uh, internet glitches. Um, no problem. I'm going to stop the slide so I can actually see the full screen because it's quite difficult at this end. Uh, all right, I'm back here. OK, we have had some good questions come through. And I'm going to pick one to start to start with, which is around malt quality. And uh, I mean, Robbie, Rob, Robbie asked, what, what's, the, what's, the, what's the relative impact of different steeping technologies on malt quality? I, I was always told that malt steeping is a, in, is a critical part of the malting process in order to get germination to run. So what, is there any comment on malt quality? Yes, absolutely. Um, I'd take your, your comment uh, one step further, Julian, probably say it, it's the most important part of the of the malting process. Um, so if, if you don't get your malt quality right coming out of steep tank, then I'm afraid you're, um, you're onto a, uh, not a great situation, onto a loser from the start, really. Um, the, the, the technologies do, uh, they do have, um, that's, that's often why, um, you know, different plants will take, make different malt qualities. Uh, it, it has, you know, a lot to do with steeping systems, the germination and, and ultimately the kilning systems as well, but probably the biggest impact would be the steeping system deployed. Um, the, the ability to, to uh, hydrate the grain as many times as, as you would like at the right frequency to be able to um, control the amount of CO2 uh, extracted, the, the temperature of the air applied, uh, etc. And of course, the, the height of the tank, um, as, a, as an effect on pressure or on the grain, they all do. Um, I would say probably, um, you know, if you if you didn't have to consider water utilisation and um, uh, and operational costs long term, you would be thinking that probably a flat bottom tank would give them the best malt quality in some way. Um, but but clearly, conical tanks are uh, advantageous from a water um, usage point of view, and and the most modern large conical tanks do go a long way to reducing the, the concerns on uh, malt quality at, at the end of it. So as, as, a, as a maltster, as a master maltster, I would probably prefer a, a flat bottom tank if I could have one. Uh, but, uh, but you can make very good quality from a, uh, from a, a conical bottom tank uh, with the right control of, um, of air temperatures and CO2 extraction, etc. Okay, great. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll, just, I'll just put in a question here, which is, uh, it's one I have uh, not not that came up, but one I have uh, separately, which is that eco eco steeps are not actually that common. And what you've just said about flat bottom technology and so on, sort of in in mind, why why do you think eco steeps have not actually taken off in a bigger way? I think probably all all malting companies have considered the um, the advantages and disadvantages of, of an eco eco steeping type of technology, and I've looked at the. Uh, the main disadvantage, which is controlling uh, the temperature of the grain in the air rest phases and, and the effect of losing control of that uh, phase, uh, would have a malt quality. As I said, it's, you know, steeping is the most important part of the, of the malting process. Um, we, we have a tank um, and we make very good quality from that tank, but we, we I guess, design our, our steeping regimes around the limitations of the tank. And we also have a tank in our, in, uh, in our growth in uh, a relatively temperate climate where we don't have high summer temperatures or um, um, particularly cold uh, winter temperatures either. So we're able to, um, uh, I guess, live with the, with the limitations of the, of the system. But if you lived in a, a you know, operated your maltings in a, a much warmer climate than that in the summer, then, uh, then it, it would be a more of a concern for, um, uh, from from a malt quality point of view, uh, with the with the heat generation and lack of ability to to keep it under control, um, if the grain is very vigorous and and respir respiring, I mean ultimately the technology is probably more expensive to install as well um, than than a conventional flat bottom steep tank, um, and you know you, you have to offset the the additional um, in, uh, capex costs of of build against the the water savings for the long term. Um, and I can see that there is, of course, a water saving um, and it will um, 
at least in part, uh, compensate for the additional um, uh, uh, capex cost originally. But you know, all of these things need to be considered, and I suspect that's why ultimately, when the decision has been made that uh, that multin companies have have chosen an, another path um, in comparison to um, to selecting an ecosystem. Okay, a couple of questions here on, on OptiSteep. So, one from Michael, he says, OptiSteep cleaning processes would also take out redu and reduce germination inhibitors. Is that correct? I believe so. I'm not, I'm not the authority on, uh, on OptiSteeps, but I, I believe so, yes, um, it does. And that's, uh, you know, that's one of the things which has uh, been a concern from utilizing a single immersion. Um, steeping system historically is the is the build up of steeping inhibitors, which uh, which we are aware are leached from the grain during the uh, the immersion phase. Um, so yes, um, OptiSteep does take that out during the, the steeping process to um, uh, ultimately so that that inhibitor is not um, maintained in the tank, so that you can progress with the the longer single immersion uh, process. Okay, and and a question from Sean Pritchard: How 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 are absorption columns? How, how are they recovered in optistic processing? Because presumably they get dissolved, sorry, absorbed organic materials. How do you how, how are they regenerated? I think they're backwashed, um, and I think they generate an effluent from them. I'm I'm not the expert, but I'm aware that roughly that we you do have to carry out a cleaning process. Yes, they they do require. Um, to be clean so that the um, the absorption efficiency is maintained from batch to batch to batch. Yeah. Okay. Uh, another question from from Sean. What, what what's the challenge of RO retentate discharge? Um, I'm guessing the question is around about salt content. Um, so it, it is a higher salt con The discharge is a higher salt content than than conventional effluent would be. Uh, I can speak for ourselves. We've had conversations with our local authorities about that, and they haven't been concerned. Um, I'm not, uh, strictly speaking, a water scientist, but I do understand the, the buffering effect and, and ultimately the dilution effect when we are adding our um, small volume of more uh, concentrated, uh, from a salt point of view, effluent into the um, the local um, municipal treatment systems. It's, it's very quickly diluted with other effluents and buffered out so that. It doesn't affect ultimately the pH um, to any significant extent in any way uh, within the, the local um, local treatment system. So, it, uh, I guess everything's relative. It, it, it is higher in salt content than perhaps a, a typical discharge would be, but it's it's not a concern to um, uh, the local authority water treatment uh, um, that we've that we've discussed it with in a couple of places in the UK. Yeah. Okay. A question from uh, Jake Lambert, Chris Bolt. So, for RO treated water to be returned to production, do you need to chlorinate that to maintain water quality? No, not at all. No, it's uh, it's very very clean. It doesn't have any uh, bacteria or viruses at all. Um, so we don't we don't chlorinate it. No, um, it just comes straight off RO. We've done various. Um, so we've been operating the technology for, as I said, about eight or nine years now. Um, and before that, we, we've shown that uh, uh, malting barley um, is, it germinates just exactly as you would expect with uh, with normal water from um, uh, from the tap main supply. Uh, there's no effect on um, on steeping uh, vigor at all, uh, uh, respiration vigor and steeping process. Um, the, the barley reacts um, to our water as it would uh, conventional mains water. Yeah, right. A question here from Luke Ramsey, and talking about trade-offs between water efficiency and energy use efficiency. Given that the change, the changes in energy costs, had any comment? Hmm. Uh, certainly, the uh, I guess the calculation has, has changed. Uh, yeah, Luke, uh, probably when uh, when many of these plants were uh, were. Um, Designed and, and the calculations were made about the, the ongoing op, uh, operational costs. Uh, an assumption was made on the electrical consumption, in particular of these plants and the cost of that. Um, so I guess the probably the, the bar has moved. Um, uh, of course, you know nowadays electrical consumption, energy consumption, and water and effluent uh, consumptions and generations they're all important. Um, so you know, 
the you have to, you know we're under pressure uh, in a good way to reduce those um, uh, from our, our customers and from local authorities and from SEPA and environmental agency etc. Um, so you know the, the picture is a complex one, um, but uh, but you know we, we cannot well we don't believe we can kind of focus on reducing energy and at the expense of generating large volumes of high strength effluent either. So um, so I think it probably the um, a balance needs to be struck, Luke, and um, you know, local situations will determine what that balance is and whether there's renewable energy, for example, to, to utilise the, um, the treatment system to um, reduce the impact of, uh, of the energy usage um, on the site. Okay, and Callum Bennett asks, do you think the future costing calculations when commissioning new plants will be impacted by any carbon taxes that may come in the future? Um, Yes, yes, I think it will. Um, uh, the environmental um, approval process for our new maltings will inevitably get stricter and stricter, um, and that will inevitably have a cost impact um, in, a, in a very simplistic manner. Um, I can say without disclosing anything sensitive that we've, we as, as Beards have had to put in some um, additional environmental uh, treatment systems to uh, to build our plant in Inverness that many other maltings in the UK have not had to put in when they were uh, being built and uh, that ultimately has a cost uh, that costs you know, ultimately increased the, the overall cost of the build and the, uh, you know, the length of time that, uh, that it takes to pay back any, any uh, monies which are uh, bent on capex so yes yeah, yes it will and I expect it to be an ever increasing uh, challenge for for maltsters wanting to build or indeed um, increase the capacity of their of their sites. Um, environmental legislation will just get more and more difficult to comply with, and I think everybody probably understands that. Yeah, right. I've got a key, a really interesting question here for the for the because I know there'll be people on the call that are in, involved in breeding programs. It's also from Luke. So, uh -huh. are there grain characteristics or breeding targets could that could interact positively with these different different steeping technologies? And do we have the more opt do we have the optimum level of germination inhibitors? Um, yes, yeah, so I guess that's the, the age old question. You know, how do you how do you improve the uh, the malting barley uh, for uh, optimizing the malting process? So, um, I guess probably barley which which hydrates evenly and vigorously uh, would suit technology which utilizes less water and generates less effluent. So. Uh, but of course, you know, speaking from a UK point of view, the um, the, the dormancy here that we have is uh, you'd, you'd say is probably advisable uh, in certain climates and parts of the UK uh, to protect against the um, I guess the challenging weather patterns that we would have across the, the spring, summer, and, and autumn uh, in Scotland. Um, period of time. So you, you can't kind of remove the, the, the inbuilt dormancy to, to make the, the grain, you know, um, hydrate and, and germinate extremely quickly, like potentially there would be in other geographies. Uh, I know that, you know, we have, we operate some maltings in uh, in sister companies in geographies and other sides of the world and their, their barley definitely hydrates uh, faster and uh, germinates faster, but it has, it has much less dormancy. So probably, I, I would say, you know, that, that trade off, finding the right balance, you know, if we can somehow find dormancy for the field, but not for the malt things, that would be perfect. Uh, Luke, if, if you <laughs> set up that project, that would be brilliant. Yeah, okay, question here. During the dry air rest, some processors perform overhead spraying. Um, what, what's your take on the impact of the, uh, to quality versus any additional water juice that you get from some overhead sprays? Yes, um, yeah, I, I didn't, I guess, describe it there. Certainly, it, it's our sort of technology we do, we do deploy. Um, so typically, when you're, you're extracting CO2 uh, from the vessel through the, the bottom of the tank, and ultimately, when you're pulling large volumes of uh, of sorry um, air through the tank, uh, you're you're drying out the surface of the tank. Um, my experience, is you can dry out the, the top three or four inches quite easily. Um, and periodically applying small sprinkle of, uh, of water to the surface of the tank uh, just to maintain that uh, damp surface on the outside of the grain does does improve quality. You, if you don't uh, do it, then you, you're, I guess, at risk of um, generating uh, 
whole corns, uh, you know, slightly under modified grains um, at the end as malt quality. Uh, and I, I have, as a, as a maltster previously, I have um, I have seen the, the effect of not having sprays on the top of a tank. It can be quite uh, quite stark, and uh, depending on the volume in particular of the uh, of the air that you suck through the tank to maintain um, the the right temperature in, in the tank uh, during the air rest phase. So, uh, from a malt quality point of view, I think quite important. Yes. Uh, but I would say a relatively small volume of water actually is needed, so not not a big impact on the uh, the water and F1 uh, overall for the site. Okay, just a couple of couple of couple of re remaining questions before we wrap the session up. So uh, this is from Robbie. So, and he, he says probably a dumb question, but where does the salt come from in the process, and how dependent is it upon the source or genotype of the original grain? There's no such a thing as a dumb question. No, not at all. No. Absolutely not. Um, so uh, the salts, uh, I think, largely are in are in the water already. Um, I imagine there's some leaching of uh, of some salt compounds from the grain, uh, but because we are um, um, carrying out the reverse osmosis process, we're uh, to ultimately to, to filter the grain. Uh, sorry, filter the the water to a very very high standard. We retain the salts on on one side of the barrier, so that's what. We're effectively just concentrating up the salts that are there um, through um, from the from the main you know, the original starting water content, and then anything you leach out of the uh, of the grain during the steeping process. Excellent. Uh, right. Okay. This this is the last my last question. So, and it goes back uh, to the beginning of the question. This is from Sean Pritchard. He says, "Is anyone looking at the recovery of carbon dioxide from either steeping or germination?" I think people have looked at it in the past, yes. Um, I think the concentration of carbon dioxide is relatively low in comparison to the, the volume of air from both steeping and germination. So I think the the size of the equipment to to capture carbon dioxide um, uh, would be would be large uh, for a relatively low benefit, I think. And that's I guess why um, molten molten companies haven't deployed it yet. Uh, it's not to say it won't come in the future, uh, but I, I'm not so sure that the technology is there perfectly at the moment. Um, I guess watch the space the long term as, as carbon dioxide, I'm sure, um, is becomes a, an, an ever bigger challenge for, uh, for society. Brilliant. Richard, thank you again for that uh, excellent talk and hand, handling what was a, a large number of questions. Yeah, indeed. Uh, thank you, yeah. everybody, for those questions. Yeah, very really good. Thanks, everybody, for join for joining the session. And I was just going to ask Donna, do, do you want to, or Robbie, do you want to announce the next talk in the series? Is there another one lined up? Just put the details into the chat. Um, the registration link is in there as well. Just type that up. You just putting it in there. I haven't seen it come up yet. No, it's at the beginning. But hold on. It's at the beginning. Sorry. I've just pulled up the report up. So hold on. I'll tell you what it is. So the next one is on the 16th of March at 2 o'clock, and it's mining barley genetic resources for adaptive traits by Zikara Cahill from Ikata in Morocco. Fantastic. Look forward. Look forward to that. Okay. So thank thanks for everybody for staying on the line despite the internet glitches. Thanks, Richard. Thanks. Okay. Good, Good to hear thank you all. Brilliant. See you later, everybody. Take care. Bye. Cheerio.